Welcome back to my sixth video on PixInsight processing. And in this video, we're going to look at deconvolution. It's been a few days since the last video. It's amazing, even in self-isolation, how many things your spouse can find you can do around the house. Here we are at last to go for the biggie, which is sometimes the most feared, complex, and misunderstood process in astrophotography imaging. On the screen we have a colour image of M3 and before we start deconvolution it's worth discussing when to use it. This particular image was shot with a 2000mm focal length telescope and with a colour CMOS camera with very small pixels around uh, 3.5 microns. If you're using a short telescope, maybe 300mm, 400mm, somewhere around that, with fairly large pixels of 5 microns, you may find that there's insufficient imaging resolution by each pixel to make deconvolution work, because what it requires and depends upon is a degree of oversampling. And that means that each individual star occupies more than one or two pixels. And if I zoom in to two times and pull out, you can see that each star is occupying a whole group of pixels and that means it will work with deconvolution. Having said that, however, deconvolution cannot make a perfect star appear as a single pixel point of light and when we come on a little later to look at the star shapes in the image there will be a point which says you can't really improve on what you have there already and so therefore deconvolution is an unnecessary step which may introduce more bad things into the image in the in form of digital artifacts than fix things in terms of making star sizes smaller. The first thing to note is that it's often better to do deconvolution on a monochrome image. And in common with many other astrophotographers, I tend to do my image processing in two main channels. One on the luminance information, which has all the sharpness and detail, and a second channel or workflow on the colour information. Now the colour information does not have to be as detailed and as sharp and often has a higher signal to noise ratio as well. So the first thing to do is extract the luminance information from this image and PixInsight makes this very easy with a tool at the top here which is a RGB rainbow with a little grayscale image next to it and if I click that it gives me my monochrome image. So I'll take my screen stretched colour image and shrink it down and then I'm going to screen stretch my monochrome image. And this is what we're going to apply deconvolution to. To start with I'm going to assemble a number of useful tools which we will probably require through the process. One is the deconvolution tool itself, another is uh, a multi-scale tool which allows me to isolate the stars, a stretching tool, in this case histogram transformation, star mask, convolution or blurring, and range selection, which is another mask tool. The first thing to do is let's take a look at the deconvolution tool and see the different sections and explain what these mean. Double clicking it brings up a familiar set of individual tools that you can collapse and expand. If we look at the first one, labelled PSF or point spreading function, it allows us to define what the shape of the star will be. So for instance, under parametric PSF, where you basically plug in your own number, it is estimating what a star would appear like with that blurring function from the atmosphere and the optics and so forth. You can also do one which allows for motion blur or one called external, which we will use, where you physically measure the stars in your image and it works out for itself an exact model of how a point source is translated in the image. The second section, called Algorithm, normally left at the default, which is called Regularized Richardson Lucy. I don't know what it means. It's one of a number of different ideas, but this one seems to work the best and we'll leave at the default 10 iterations. This is one of those processes that, and we're going to apply it to luminance, which is always the case anyway with a monochrome image. Collapsing that and expanding the next is something called deringing. The deringing is to do with 
the fact that when you start doing deconvolution it produces small dark rings around the stars. And there are a number of sections to this. There's one that stops the dark ring and sometimes you get bright rings alternating bright and dark rings and this can improve that. And sometimes in areas of high brightness where a star is you may get a ring that's difficult to remove and so you can apply more deringing in a localized area. Lastly down the bottom here we have something called wavelet regularization and what this does is it does a noise analysis so it only applies deconvolution where noise levels are above a certain threshold at different scales. If we didn't have this it would try to sharpen up all the noise and it'll make the background appear more mottled than it normally is. So I'm just going to hit reset and move all these back to defaults, disable everything. So I'm going to start from the top and work our way down. And that's the best way of approaching deconvolution. The tool itself is a strong hint of how to work this because otherwise what happens is, is you start playing with each of the individual controls and they do interact to some degree and you'll endlessly go around in circles altering one and changing another and I found it's better sometimes to start with a sensible value from the top and progressively add more and more values as you go down the options. So with everything disabled at the moment I'm going to collapse these and going to look at the first one which is the point spreading function itself. And to do that I need another tool, one of the dynamic tools which doesn't sit very well as an icon on the screen. So I'm going to collapse this for the moment. I'm going to bring up a process, image, dynamic PSF. And what this is, is a star measuring tool. And when you click on stars in the image, what it does is it measures their eccentricity, their size, and it tries to classify them in terms of what star profile you have. And we're going to start with looking at stars around the perimeter of this image rather than the core where it's rather difficult to make a measurement. And we're going to choose a number of stars, not too small, not too big, and evenly around the image, bearing in mind that you sometimes get eccentricity not only from tracking errors but also from collimation errors or field curvature. So it's useful to click stars all around the periphery so you get an even spread of eccentricities that will average out. So I'm going to start clicking on stars like these ones here which are sort of small but distinct. I will not click on stars which are really tiny like these ones here and you probably at a minimum need about 20 and they need to be quite well separated so that they don't have you know like binary stars which again could confuse the measurement. And each time you click on it on the right hand side of the screen you can see that it's classifying the star, it's measured it and it's putting it in order. That one didn't work so I'm going to remove that one. If you hit the minus button here you can take out the last few. I missed the star. Sometimes it helps to zoom in. So this is half life size and you can put in a few more. And while you're doing this you can see that sometimes it puts a little crosshair on the star which shows if there's eccentricity what the angle of that eccentricity is. So in that case the little cross is sort of in that angle pointing towards the middle as you'd expect with a, a correctly collimated telescope. Once you've done a few and we've gone around the edges choosing the stars that look a good compromise, what we then do is we take an average of them and the tool on the right hand side of the screen will do that for us. Uh, do that one. And just a couple more and I think we're done. These ones are a bit too tightly clustered to, uh, to find something that's distinct. You wouldn't choose this one because these two are too close and that one would affect the measurement and you have to just be a little cautious about which ones you select. Okay, so having done that we can see that we've chosen stars all the way around 
which are of reasonable shape. And on this side, we can see it's listed all the stars and it's listed them all in terms of their size and shape. And what we're going to do is, apart from this one here, there's a couple listed Gaussian, which are particularly bloated. So I'm just going to remove that one. And I think that's the only Gaussian one there. And what this word Gaussian and Moffat mean is their star shapes. And typically, most stars are what they call a, Mo a Moffat shape. And the Gaussians tend to be rather bloated for some other reason. And if you ever have Lorentzian stars, lots of those, they're far more spiky in profile. And that normally means that your telescope's rather good and you don't need to do deconvolution. So I'm going to select one and then shift select the last one and hit this little camera icon and this produces a small image. And the image is automatically labeled PSF. And as you can see, it's a blurred star. And this is a model of what a star, which is at the end of the day, a point source gets translated to. So over 27 pixels by 27 pixels. When you strive for smaller and smaller pixels on cameras, remember your optics are often not up to it or more to the point, neither is the atmosphere. So if I shrink that down for the moment, I can now cancel that and exit it. And under deconvolution, I can select the file we've just made, which is called PSF. And the little picture comes up here and we can now shrink that down. The next stage is to apply it and see which settings work best. To start with, what I'm going to do is use a preview. And there are a couple of tricks to using the preview that make it more effective. We know that previews are a quick and dirty way to evaluate settings on any process tool. And it's tempting to draw a preview that simply covers a few stars in the background and look at the PixInsight deconvolution algorithm does to it. However, in practice, I found that they don't work very well and give distorted results. And I get better consistency when I apply it to the entire image if I take a preview that covers not only the dark areas with a few stars, but the bright central core as well. Or if you're doing a galactic image, includes the galaxy as well as the star background. Or if you're doing nebulosity, it includes areas of bright nebulosity as well as stars on their own on a dark background. So choose a preview that covers a range of different image styles and types and brightnesses. And if we click on the preview and expand it, we can see our stars and we're going to evaluate the deconvolution tool on this preview. So opening up the tool, we've already set up our PSF. We have the standard settings for the algorithm and we're going to apply it. And you can immediately see that the stars have tightened up but some of the bigger ones especially have black rings around them. And if you toggle between the different states, you can see the stars are getting smaller and have better definition, especially in here. But those black rings are objectionable. So what we have to do is get rid of them. And that's what the deringing part of the tool does. So if I just reset this for the moment and bring up deringing, if I leave it at the default value, the likelihood is that it will look absolutely awful. I was right. So what I discovered is that values typically 100 times smaller than this are normally about right for my images of my camera. So if I reset and apply again, so that's a much better setting. Again, toggling buttons and forwards, you can see that the stars have got smaller and there's no ringing around the stars at all. The black rings have disappeared. In fact, I probably can go a bit further and reduce this down to 0, 5 and start again. The idea being to find a value that just has the smallest of dark rings around the stars. Now, you can see that the background started to curdle and that's what I was saying about deconvolution acts upon the noise, but we'll fix that at a later stage. So I would say that the stars are just a little bit underdone. So I'm not worried too much about these bright ones in here, 
I'm really looking at the tiny stars out in the outer field. When they're right, then I can move on to the next step. So, whoops, wrong one. Let's have a look. It sometimes takes a few seconds for your eyes to acclimatize to the difference. And sometimes it's good to look away at the screen, then look back at the screen. I'm going to drop that down just one more step. Reason being is that some of the other tools that we apply later on in the deconvolution process will also do de-ringing. And this is the irony. The, the algorithm itself makes the stars smaller and everything ben beneath it in the, in the tool makes the stars bigger. So it's a balancing act. I'm going to leave that as it states there. Reset there. Try that again and I should get just a little bit in the way of dark circles. But as you can see, the stars have clearly got smaller and tighter, which is good. In fact, I'm going to go be brave and go one more. Yep, I'm fine with that. And some of this is experience because you've been here before, and some of it is, is chance. So there's always the room for experimentation and your values are likely to be different to mine with a different camera and a different sensor. Let's shrink that down again and reset and then move on to the next. This is where we try to stop the deconvolution algorithm working on the background. And again, there are a number of different methods of stopping this happen. The next section in the deconvolution process is something called wavelet regularization. Rather a fancy word for, in effect, noise protection. So if we enable it, it brings up a number of different features. And what I typically do is choose B3 spline 5 as the default one, which is good. I normally increase the number of wavelet layers to three because what this is doing is it's looking at noise at different scale. So it's looking at very fine noise, pixel to pixel, and more blotchy noise as well. On very poor images, you may have to go up to even four layers. And what you have here is a noise threshold and a noise reduction amount. And typically what happens with these tools is you will have a higher noise threshold on the smallest scale with decreasing values going down. And the same with the amount. So this is 100%, this is 70%, and this may be 50% or something like that. If we apply that and try it at that setting, we can take a look at what happens to the background. If we toggle it backwards and forwards, you can see that while the background has still changed a little bit, it's nowhere near as bad as it used to be. And we can probably improve on it by going to four layers and dropping that down to there, and perhaps going up to about there. Again, you get a feeling for values and if I just reset the tool and apply it again. So if I now toggle, the background is pretty good and the stars have got tighter and there's only just the hint of dark circles around the stars, which means that I probably need to just improve my de-ringing by a little bit. So I'm going to bring that up to 0.4 reset the tool and try again. I reckon that's pretty good. Bearing in mind that this is a medium grey and that normally this would be much darker than this and so the dark rings won't really show up. There's one other thing you might have to do in regard to de-ringing which isn't a problem in this particular image and that is that in bright areas some stars still get dark circles even when the stars surrounded by dark sky have none. And the reason that for that is is complex and built into the mass, but there is a way around it. So if I just shrink that for a second and go back to the main image, one of the things that you can do is selectively apply more de-ringing to bright areas. And there's a number of ways of doing that. And perhaps one of the simplest ways in this particular image, because we only have stars and we don't have any large scale galaxies or nebulas in, is I can create a clone of this image by dragging the tab and stretching it. So 
So at the moment it already has a screen stretch, so I need to remove the screen stretch. And I'm going to stretch the image a couple of times. OK. And that's a fairly effective way of creating a sort of mask. If I look carefully at the image, you can see that the image isn't zero. So what I need to do is I need to trim it back to about there and then reapply and the background will get darker. OK, so this I can now use as an image, as a stand-in substitute for a star mask. And as you can see, because there's only stars, it's made quite a good mask. And what I might do is just slightly blur it. So bringing up the convolution tool, which looks very much like our PSF function. In fact, what it's doing is it's generating a spreading function. So I'm going to do a nine pixel burr, which just takes the edge off the tool. OK, so I can get rid of that for the moment and I can give it a name that's meaningful. So I'm going to put support image and shrink that down. If I bring up my preview again, whoops, if your cursor strays into this area at the side here, it um, brings up the, the Explorer tab. So sometimes you have to drag your image over a bit to stop that happening. So if I reset my tool here, bring up T deconvolution again, bring up deringing, I can now do local deringing and here select the file I've just done, which is called support image. And when I hit apply, it'll apply a further degree of deringing to the brighter stars. Now, if you overdo this, what it does is actually creates a white halo around the stars and they grow in size. So if you click and unclick, you can see that the big stars have not changed at all. And that's because this has been overplayed. So as I said, I don't really need it on this particular image, but typically if you had a bright star overlaying on a galaxy or a nebula, you may still get a dark halo. And this is what you do to get rid of it. And often you might be in, you might be supporting it for like 10 to 30%. You wouldn't normally be up the top end here. So maybe around 10, 15%. And you might find that that's just about right. It's not doing too much harm in this particular case. It just means that my big stars haven't changed much, whereas my small stars have. So I'm going to get rid of that for the moment because I don't actually need it. And clicking on the full image, we then hit apply. Now, one of the tricks you can do is because all the subsequent steps to the initial deconvolution blur the result again, you may find that you've lost the, the advantage in the first place. And it's, it's often the case that once you, you actually apply it, you think, well, that didn't make much difference. And it's not uncommon to go back to the algorithm tab and simply increase the number of iterations until you start to see artifacts. So it's not uncommon for me to start with 10. And when I get to the end of the process, I might have 20 or 30. And we can have a look at that effect. So for instance, if I clear the preview and apply 10, If I change that to 20, I think I can just reapply without resetting. We'll have a look in a minute. You see that the stars have got smaller, but now you've got little black circles around them. So there's a, this balancing act between overdoing it and underdoing it. And if you're not careful on a cluster, it can look a little bit strange. Um, the stars don't look natural. And the whole point about editing is to make things look natural. I'm going to back off to the 10 and leave it at that for the moment and apply to the whole image. And because it's a big image, it's going to take a few seconds. So I'm going to pause the video and come back when it's completed. OK, and can shrink the tool down. And let's have a look at this image and see how good it is. In fact, I'm going to apply this one that makes it even bigger. And if I go to half life size, if I move that out of the way, and if I hit undo and redo, you can see the stars have become more distinct and the cores have become smaller. So the, the big stars, the cores have become less bloated and more focused. Deconvolution doesn't do miracles. 
but it does improve the image and it doesn't just improve star shapes. If you have nebulosity or a galaxy with details, it also improves definition. And so one of the other things that you sometimes see people do, and I used to do at the beginning, was when it came to the regularization to protect your background levels, I tended to avoid doing that and I used a background mask to in effect block off the areas of, of the background. In retrospect is not as effective as using the regularization. Again if I undo that that looks quite good there and if I look into this section here I haven't got any objectionable stars going in the middle but as you see that the definition improves further in towards the core and it doesn't look unnatural which is the key thing here. So deconvolution isn't too difficult in fact it probably takes longer to explain it than do it but if you follow the steps in the order I propose I think you'll find you do get to sensible results quite quickly. Thanks for watching and we will start to look at workflows for different types of images in part 7.